Welcome back everyone, this is Probing Paul, my monthly Q&A series that lets my fans get a better feel for who I am on the inside. My questions today were all taken from the comment section of last month's Probing Paul, so feel free to ask me more questions in that area down below. You'll also find timestamps in the video description, those are helpful. Without further ado, let's dive right in. Today's video is brought to you by the Paul's Hardware Store on paulshardware.net, the only official source for Paul's Hardware merchandise. Tantalizing t-shirts, brilliant beer sets, high quality hoodies, and more, all featuring the classic thumbscrew for tasteful and refined viewers, or the 8-bit thumbscrew for tasteful and refined viewers who hate curves. New designs are added sporadically and at random, so head over to paulshardware.net and get some of that sweet, sweet merch right now. Or not right now, after you watch the video. Either way. As is tradition, we begin with a look at the Probing Paul playlist. It's linked in the description too. And here you can see all of the various times I've been probed in the past. It's like looking down the cornhole of history. To begin today, we have a question from Addetectatl1. Hey, Pauly. Hey, hey, Dictatl. Should I water cool my 7900 XTX? Also, what do you think about GPU AIO solutions? I'm going to slightly broaden this question to be, should you water cool your graphics card in general? And yes, this is going to be somewhat of a rebuttal or at least somewhat related to my recent tech news video titled Liquid Cooling is Dead. And that title, which yes, is, is a little bit leading, but also worked really well because the video performed well. But it was specifically about the Thermalrite Phantom Spirit 120 Evo. And it was based on this newish air cooler from Thermalrite, the follow-up to the Phantom Spirit which itself was a follow-up to the Peerless Assassin, and this goes for about $43 right now. Now, if I may clarify or reiterate my stance in that video to be a little bit more straightforward for people, I wasn't saying that water cooling is dead. Okay, I did say that in the video, but if I was to broaden that title and make it less clickable, I would have said water cooling is dead for all but the top tier CPUs, and I guess in this case, to respond to your question, I would say GPUs as well. My opinion there, and yes, it is my opinion, and people are absolutely free to disagree with me, is that spending the extra cash that you would on an all-in-one liquid cooler, those usually start at about $100, but often cost $150, $200, or even well above $200 these days if you get one of the highest end ones, but that $100 or so premium that you're spending just on cooling, if you're not already running the top end chip, whether you're talking about a CPU or a GPU, that money would be much better invested in upgrading your CPU or your GPU to the next tier up. So that would mean like upgrading your Intel 14600K to an Intel 14700K or even an Intel 14900K. Or if you're talking AMD, that would mean going from a Ryzen 7600 or 7600X to a 7700 or a 7700X or going up to the 7800X3D. In, I would argue, the majority of these upgrade situations, the extra money would get you more performance if you upgrade the core or CPU or GPU, then upgrade your cooling. Now, if you're running the top CPU that you could, like a 7950X3D or a 14900K or KS, you can't really increase your CPU's performance from there because there is not a higher tier CPU to upgrade to. So in that case, if you still have money to spend and you want to spend it on your CPU performance or your GPU performance, then I would say go right ahead, invest in some liquid cooling and get yourself marginally more performance with that top tier CPU because that's the only way you're going to get better performance performance outside of waiting for a new generation of CPUs or GPUs to launch. So with that general principle in mind, let's circle back to your original question. And that is, should you water cool your GPU? And what do I think of all-in-one liquid coolers for graphics cards? This is an AMD Radeon Vega graphics card, which was only available in a liquid cool variety. They might have had a couple air-cooled versions of this. And this was actually a, a somewhat good example of AMD realizing this is the top tier GPU they could make. The only way they were able to make it better was by slapping a liquid cooler on it so that they could run it at a higher frequency out of the box. It's funny because I haven't pulled this GPU out in quite some time and there's like a little bit of residue. It looks like some oil or something going on here. But the reason I pulled uh, this out as an example and also this water block graphics card out, which still has some of the liquid inside, is just to say, yes, go ahead and liquid cool your graphics card. Whether you're talking about purchasing an all-in-one liquid cooler that's pre-installed or modifying or upgrading your existing air-cooled graphics card by removing the cooler and adding a block and doing a custom loop. Just be aware of what you're getting yourself into. A custom liquid-cooled setup can go off without a hitch, can run for an extended period of time without even requiring maintenance, at least if you're going with not an opaque fluid like this. You're just sticking with distilled water, maybe with some additives for anti-corrosion and antibacterial growth. But just know that you're introducing more potential points of failure to your system, whether you're talking about the actual fitting connections for a custom loop setup, or even with a pre-made all-in-one liquid cooler, you have 
Less likely the chance of like leakage with the tubing, that can happen sometimes, but here you have the potential for pump failure. And I would also say in terms of parts longevity with liquid cooling all-in-one setups, I generally give them about a three year lifespan before I start to get a little bit concerned about them. Yes, some can continue to run without issues uh, beyond that, but part of the reason I pulled this one out as an example of an older card in terms of GPU longevity is if you have a liquid cooled card or a liquid cooled system and it's three years or four years or five years down the line, I just start to get a lot more worried about potential points of failures with something like this than I would with a traditional air cooled setup. So once again, to answer your question directly, you have a 7900 XTX from AMD. That is the top GPU they currently make. So yes, water cooling that would be one of the only ways you could upgrade it or get a little bit more performance or even just having fun water cooling. I haven't given enough credit to that. It is really fun to build a water cooled system as long as you're not stressing about like a work critical system that you need to get up and running and keep up and running. And then also to succinctly clarify my recent statement that liquid cooling is dead, liquid cooling is largely impractical practical for many situations until you get to the top end hardware. That's my stance on it. Let me know in the comments section if you agree or if you disagree. And thank you to Dictatle one for your question. Next question from Phantom YouTube Official. Hey Paul, hope you're well. I am doing much better than I was last week. And I'm also glad that Joe's PC was a relatively simple fix. The system they're running is a 3900X, 32 gigs of DDR4, one terabyte storage, and an RX 6600. And yeah, that GPU is slightly underpowered for your system, but honestly, it's not that bad. The question here is about monitors. They're upgrading from a 24 inch 1080p 75 hertz monitor to 1440, 4K 144 hertz or greater. It sounds like the actual monitor hasn't been purchased yet. Uh, do monitors harm your performance or is the monitor not really as related to performance as they're led to believe? The short answer here would be no, your monitor does not directly affect your GPU's performance. Your GPU should perform roughly the same as long as it's not getting way too hot or as long as you're not underclocking it or something like that. Also note that your monitor size will not affect performance, whether you're talking about a 19 inch, 27 inch, 32 inch, or a 75 inch or larger flat screen TV. The size doesn't really matter there, the resolution does because the resolution determines how many pixels your GPU is being asked to fill out with each frame that it generates. So here's an example of some common resolutions right now, 1920 by 1080, 2560 by 1440, sometimes referred to as 2K, and then of course 4K, 3840 by 2160. But note that these are not just resolutions, they're actually math problems. So if we bring up some calculators here, we can go 1920 times 1080. That gives us a little over 2 million pixels. 2560 times 1440 is about 3.7 million pixels. And 3840 by 2160, or 4K, uh, ramps it up pretty significantly to about 8.3 million pixels. So generally speaking, and we're talking very high level ballpark numbers here because there are other factors at play that can affect the amount of frames your GPU is able to produce. But assuming we're running the same hardware and we're testing the same game, we have the same CPU and GPU, and it can output a certain level of performance at 10 2.1 million pixels. Then if you jump up to 4K, you're dealing with pretty much four times the amount of pixels, so it'll be about four times as difficult. So if at 1080, you're getting about 100 frames per second, and then you just bump up the resolution to 4K, you should, in theory, get about 25 frames per second, or about one quarter of the performance. I like looking at the raw pixel counts because this also provides a little bit of unifier for like regular 16 by nine aspect ratio monitors, 1080 and 1440 and 2160 versus say ultra wides. And again, we're speaking generally here, but like 3440 by 1440 is a pretty is a pretty common uh, widescreen aspect ratio. And we see that that's about 5 million pixels. So it comes in between 2560 by 1440 and 4K. Again, please note that we are ignoring other factors here, like the video game engine that you're working with, or potentially the amount of GPU VRAM you have, which if you cap that off and go over it, which you can often do by increasing your resolution can suddenly greatly affect your frame rates and reduce them. But also note that if you get a higher resolution, a higher refresh, rate monitor, that is just like a potential. That's the potential max performance that your GPU could output, like the max resolution and the max refresh rate, whether you're talking about 144 hertz or going up to 240 hertz. And also remember that if your GPU isn't keeping up with your monitor's current refresh rate and resolution, you can always dial down the resolution, like it's very easy to set a 4K monitor to 1440 or 1080. Or when it comes to refresh rate, this is why you should always make sure you have a variable refresh rate monitor, because if it's 144 hertz, but your GPU is actually only able to produce 90 to 100 frames per second in the game that you're playing, the monitor will automatically dial down its refresh rate to match that, and you'll still get nice, smooth game 
and play. What I would do if I was in your situation, since you already have a pretty solid PC and you actually have a decent upgrade pass since you could easily drop in like a 5800X 3D or 5700X 3D in there, would be to choose your monitor, upgrade that, see what kind of performance your RX 6600 is putting out, and then base your GPU upgrade and potentially your CPU upgrade on that so that you can, again, fill out the potential performance of the monitor that you're running. All right, the next question should be easier. This one is from ToonSim2. Does anyone know what keyboard Paul is using in his video? They are looking for a white mechanical keyboard for the home office and they like the look. So I have good news and bad news. The good news is that I can tell you what keyboard this is. It's the Corsair K70 Rapid Fire SE RGB. It actually does have RGB backlighting, although the, the manual button doesn't seem to be functioning to turn it on anymore. I, I need to like load this up with IQ software and maybe update the firmware on it. The bad news is that this keyboard is like uh, five years old or so and Corsair does not seem to make it anymore. I think I still have the wrist rest for it somewhere. Oh, and actually this listing I pulled up for it isn't even the right one. This is the Mark II. I have the original non-Mark II. Okay, I'm sorry, I've, I've done more research and I think I have disappointing news. They, there was a newer version of this motherboard called the Mark II Special Edition. That one, like many discontinued PC hardware components, is really expensive and overpriced if you wanted to actually try to buy one new. It looks like you can find them used on eBay, but again, this is the Mark II, not the one that I have. This is the one that I have, K70 RGB, non-Mark II, white PBT keycaps and Cherry MX Speed RGB switch. And this is Corsair's Korean website, so I can't even tell for sure if you could actually buy this. But I guess that's the long and short of it, is that um, that's what keyboard I have, and no, you probably can't find one yourself, I'm sorry. Next question from CageMax629, how's the DIY home surveillance system holding up? Last major update was back before COVID, any new hurdles? Commodity hardware, 24-7 operation, love the home tech videos. Thank you very much, I've got more of those coming soon. So if you guys weren't familiar, I did a DIY home surveillance build, this was like four plus years ago. Yeah, November 2019, so coming up on five years. I then did a follow-up video where I admitted that I had no idea what I was doing for a lot of it, and that I was still learning a lot, and I tried to make it a learn with me sort of video. I will say, fortunately, the system was completely functional, and it did have the ability to like add in USB cameras uh, using the Contacam software, and of course, uh, access these cameras uh, that were a little bit more dedicated surveillance cameras that I got from Monoprice. I did follow up on this build in May of 2020 because it was running way too loud because uh, the CPU was uh, using a low profile cooler. So I sort of unceremoniously uh, used my rotary tool and then my angle grinder to hack the uh, a, a big chunk out of the side. And I did like a hot rod mod to it where I had a larger Noctua cooler uh, that was able to run in there with the extra space. And it just sort of sticks out a little bit, you know, it's fine gets the job done. Uh, I'm happy to say that ever since then, this was quite a few years ago, but the system has been running just fine. I did do a teardown of it in part three of my uh, home upgrade series that I did. That was about five months or so ago. It does get some dust caked up on there, so I was able to clean that off. And beyond that, it's doing just great. I guess I did a full repaste and everything like that. It had been running in my garage for quite some time. Uh, I've relocated it now. I've added more cameras. I just ended up going with the Contacam software because it was like a single time buy for the license and it's been very functional, but I can access it remotely from outside the home. I'd say the only other functional software update I made to it is setting up a Chrome remote desktop. So other than accessing the video feeds, which I can do from any network connected device or by remoting in uh, if I'm not at home, I can actually remote into the computer itself if it needs uh, to run an update or restart or anything like that. So I'm super happy with it. I just never really got to the point where I thought, ah, I'm an ex expert on this now and I can do another follow up video explaining to people how to do it themselves. And then I guess also the minor issue of home security and not sharing too much detail about how I have things set up here. Next question from Muik1. Is it an AMD 7900GRE in the box? Is it? Is it? So I did mail time in the last probing poll. I had this mystery box that I could only show people. But the answer is yes. That was totally the power color Hellhound, Hellhound Radeon RX 7900 GRE. And I actually uh, used that in this build that I did in the Corsair 2500D case. Actually, that system is now behind me on the desk because I've recently done a little bit of uh, upgrading and updating to my set here and um, it was there. So I have it there looking pretty behind me. And I suppose my final question slash uh, comment that came through a lot in the previous video was that lots of people were looking forward 
to the Mini ITX builds because not only did I show off parts for this build in mail time last month, but I also showed off parts for this build, which is a very tiny 8700G based build that I built for my sister Gretchen. That video is now up and live. If you missed it, uh, actually it turned out really good. Lots of people said that they really liked it and uh, included some testing and delivery to my sister as well. To close out today's video, I'm not gonna do official mail time. I do have a couple letters. I'm gonna save these for next time. But if you guys wanna send me something to open during my mail time segment, send it to Paul's Hardware PO Box 4325 Diamond Bar, California. And if you happened to send me one of these two letters, stay tuned, I will be opening them very soon. But just as I did last month, I wanted to sort of tease a project that I am working on. This is a DIY, trying to stick to a budget, extra large soft box because I wanna include the lighting over my table here where we do builds and stuff. And when it comes to something like a very large soft box, they can get extremely expensive or they can be very difficult to find in a size you want or you have to pay a lot to have something custom made. So I thought, why don't I try to custom make myself? Right now, it's looking like this is gonna be costing around three to $400 total. And I have had a few of the items begin to arrive. For example, this is a lighting receptacle. Super simple, super basic. It's just got four receptacles, four bulbs, a couple switches on the back, powers with an AC power cord. For the bulbs themselves, I'm going with these Philips LEDs. These are 60 watt equivalent, but actually eight watt power draw. And these actually have really high CRI, actually measured CRI rating. I think they're about 95 or 96 for CRI, and they're not terribly expensive either. They are also dimmable. So my attempt to make this kind of a smart light or something that I can actually control the light output of without having to like climb up there and mess with a switch or something is this smart plug. It's actually a smart dimmer plug. So it's meant to plug in a dimmable light and then you can remotely control it to dim stuff. I have not tested this yet, so please don't go out and start buying stuff based on this. I wanted to ask you guys if you would be interested in a dedicated video on the assembly of this. It's gonna be a wood frame. It's probably gonna be about four or five feet wide by about six feet long in terms of the actual light. And I'm planning to build a housing for it to hold the two light receptacles, the eight bulbs. As you can see, they do get pretty bright. And I've already got the wood for the framing and everything. There's just a couple more things I need for that. So in a similar fashion to the wall-sized uh, acoustic panel that I built back here, which also is RGB enabled, would you guys like to see a video on assembling this as well? Let me know in the comment section down below, as well as letting me know if you have any questions for me to answer on the next episode of Probing Paul. Thank you all for sending in the questions and a closing reminder to check out my store at paulshardware.net if you wanna buy yourself some high quality merchandise, t-shirts, hoodies, beer sets, and more. If you wanna hit the thumbs up button on this video, that's greatly appreciated. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to my channels so you can be notified of new videos when they go live. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you all in the next one.